I can't even tell you how excited I am to be here. I told Levi that I felt like Christmas came early this year because I love Pastor Levi and Jenny. Their ministry has meant the world to, to me for a long, long time. So to actually get to come to your house, to be at Fresh Life, I'm just undone. I teased Pastor Levi and told him I was afraid he got me confused with Lisa Bevere, who is another amazing <laughs> Bible teacher, but um, Lisa is just a, a tad smaller than me and off, often wears leather pants. And so I wondered if I should pretend, just in case he sent me home when he found out I wasn't Bevere, I thought I could have walked up here in leather pants, but it would sound like ducks were being killed. So. So, um, alas, I am Lisa Harper, not Bevere, but so stinking excited to be here at Fresh Life and in the middle of this series because I've been watching from Nashville, Tennessee, and I've already been so blessed by what God has poured through, um, through this series through the Holy Spirit, through Levi's throat. And so we're gonna stay right in the middle of it. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm gonna stay right in where Levi's been preaching, not as well, but we're gonna stay in that flow. First, I've gotta tell you a story before we dive into the text. We'll be in Mark, if you wanna flip there in your Bible. This was um, part of my gift basket when I arrived in Montana from Nashville yesterday. This is bear spray. And I just started laughing that I had bear spray in my, in my welcome basket. And it kind of took me back to a season when I lived in the mountains. I know you can tell I live in Nashville now because of the extra syllables and the hang, hanging diphthongs. But I used to live <laughs> in the mountains. That was diphthongs. That was not trashy. So you don't have to edit that out. Anyway, I used to live in the mountains. I lived in Colorado Springs for about six years. And I used to love to trail run in the mountains. And one of my favorite trails I used to run, not quite as pretty as, as Glacier, but still beautiful, was called Pulpit, Park, Pulpit Rock Park. And there was this trail in that park, this two and a half mile trail that snaked up through the mountains. When you got to the very top, you stepped into this alpine meadow above tree line. And from that alpine meadow, if you looked west, Pikes Peak was just right there. I mean, almost looked like you, sh you could touch it. Even in the summer, it was always shrouded with snow at the top. I thought of that when we flew in over Glacier yesterday. And I would run that trail two or three times a week. It's where I went to de-stress. Um, I was in vocational ministry then, still am. And I don't know about y'all, but sometimes Christians get on my last nerve. And so sometimes I just needed to get apart before I fell apart, you know, and I'd run that trail. Well, I was really disappointed when the newspapers and television stations started talking about criminal activity in this particular park around that particular trail, my favorite trail running trail. And they said that a man had violently attacked several women. So the police began telling people, no longer can you trail run or mountain bike on this trail until we apprehend the criminal. And I was like, doggone it, I can't believe it. And you know, that's my favorite place to go and be outside. I don't know about y'all, but sometimes I feel God's presence even more thickly when I'm outside of a building. As much as I love the brick and mortar churches, I feel like outside that sanctuary blesses me even more. And I thought, shoot, I can't believe I can't go to that trail anymore. Well, one Saturday, it was this gorgeous fall Saturday, just no humidity, blue, blue sky. And I thought, it's just too pretty for criminal activity today. <laughs> so I thought, I'm gonna chance it. I'm gonna go over to the trail, even though they've told us not to run it. I'm gonna run on my favorite trail. That's where I go to be alone with God. So I drive to the trail it's Saturday afternoon. There's only one other car in the parking lot. I step out of my car, I go to the trailhead. There are now posters from the Colorado Springs Police Department on either side of the trail, very clearly warning people, no hiking, no running, no mountain biking on this trail. And I thought, ah, I'll be fine. So I walk right past the warnings and I start running this two and a half mile trail. I start singing, I was singing a hymn. It's best for me to sing by myself. I can't carry a tune in a bucket, but I'm singing this worship song. I'm running up through these evergreens. I mean, it's just glorious. I get to the very top of this trail and right before I step out into that alpine meadow to just kind of marinate in the glory of Pikes Peak, I stop dead in my tracks behind this huge ponderosa pine tree because from me to, I'm gonna say this camera guy right here, although this has nothing more to do with him, so don't email ugly things fresh in my life about him, but just maybe 15 feet from me, there was a naked man 
And I was like, oh, you are kidding me. Yeah, I'm like, I was singing a hymn. I was being all spiritual. And now I've run into the criminal in his birthday suit. And so at first I was really indignant because I thought, oh my goodness, this is my favorite quiet place. And this guy's just spoiling it with all his trashiness. And then I realized, you know what? I'm actually in a pretty vulnerable place, which is what the bear spray reminded me of. I wish I'd had bear spray Um, on that particular run. I thought, oh my goodness. I left my cell phone in the car. The sun is starting to set. I'm two and a half miles into the wilderness. I have not seen another person on this trail. And I thought, oh goodness gracious. It's just me and the criminal. And I thought, he hadn't seen me yet. He was kind of looking off. I'm mostly behind this pine tree. And I thought, oh goodness. If I turn and start running back down, he'll see me and definitely hear me. I'm not exactly a quiet runner. And I thought, you know, should I stay and fight? Or should I run? I just felt so vulnerable. And when I get scared, I'm like a junior high boy on Mountain Dew. I just, I can't think (laughs) clearly. And the only two thoughts in my head that we're gonna call logic on this day of worship are one thought I had was I had um, seen, I think on Oprah, that men who expose themselves are typically cowards and non-confrontive. So I had that thought. The only other kind of clear thought in my mind that afternoon was I had read in one of my hiking magazines that if you live west of the Mississippi and you come upon a wild animal, unless it's a bear, if you come upon a a wild animal other than a bear, it behooves you to put your hands over your head and advance toward the wild animal, all the while speaking in deep guttural tones because then that scares them and they think you're a bigger, scarier animal. So I'm, I'm thinking these two thoughts behind that tree and I thought, okay, okay, I'm gonna fight. I thought, I'm gonna jump out from behind this tree and I'm gonna try to scare the naked man before he tries to attack me. And so I jump out from behind the tree. I promise y'all this is truth. I tell y'all if I was lying in church. I jump out from behind the tree and I start running toward the naked man just like this. Hey! And it worked because he jumped up obviously terrified, turned around and took off running in the opposite direction. Now here's the deal. When he turned around and took off running, I noticed for the first time, I promised that he was actually wearing these really small blue running shorts. You know, um, sometimes guys wear those really trashy tiny shorts when they're serious about running and they have slits on the side. Well, this guy was wearing those just tiny, tiny minuscule shorts and he was sitting and the way the split had splayed, y'all, I promise he looked so naked. Um, But he's running, as he's running away from me, he keeps looking over his shoulder, you know, obviously scared to death that I'm gonna chase him. You know, I'm just this big girl with my hands over my head screaming at him and I got so tickled and I thought, I bet you he is still in therapy trying to deal with running into this woman screaming. He was probably having a quiet time. I thought of that when we flew over the mountains yesterday. I got the bear spray. And then it reminded me of something I told you. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm not completely dumb. I brought my study guide of take back your life with me. And at the very beginning on day one, Pastor Levi says this, looks can be deceiving. We can look at something, but not see what's there. And That means we cannot trust what we see with the naked eye. Scaring innocent men loitering in Mount Meadows, y'all, that is mild compared to the damage we do when we turn blurry vision toward our Creator Redeemer, toward who He is and toward who He's called us to be. I think that's my favorite thing about this particular series is taking back your life is really not so much about us. It's about us recognizing just how good our God is, actually opening our spiritual eyes to the glory and the power and the kindness and the holistic redemptive nature of our creator redeemer. And so that's where we're going to go today. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10. I should confess to you that Mark is my favorite of the four gospels. It used to be my least favorite because Mark is the shortest gospel. He uses the fastest language. That's because you probably know because Levi and Jenny are great teachers that Mark was written by John Mark. When he got older, he just said, just call me Mark. It's kind of like Southern boys. They they start with double names and they're like, no, 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 don't call me Jimmy John anymore. I'm just Jim. (laughs) Um, John Mark's name 
as, as a young guy was John Mark. His mama was a great leader in the early church. You can read about her in Acts. And so he writes it. He's, he's literate. He's educated. But the narrative voice of Mark's gospel, this euangelion, the word gospel comes from the Greek word euangelion. It means the good news. The narrative voice of Mark's gospel is Peter. And I don't know who y'all's favorite disciple is, but I love me some Pete. Because Pete was just always stepping in it. Surely he would have scared a naked woman had he been running the same trail. He's just always stepping in it. And I love that God chose Pete to lead the early church. He said, because Peter, it's not about you. It's not about your capacity. It's about my compassion. So anyway, I love the activity of Mark. I think Peter was probably a little ADD, and I am too. And so there's all these action words, but there's also this running theme of the goodness of God. Because remember Pete's backstory. Peter had thrown Jesus under the bus at his greatest point of need, vehemently and vulgarly denied that he even knew the Christ. So Pete knew that he couldn't take back his own life by himself. He knew he needed grace to get there. And this is one of my favorite stories in Mark's gospel. By the way, Mark's gospel is actually the first gospel. When they canonized scripture, they listed Matthew as the first gospel, but in written order, Mark is actually the very first literary compilation of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ. So I love that too. Anyway, this is Mark 10. I'm reading from the ESV, so it may differ a bit from the translation you prefer. Beginning at verse 46. And they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving, they're talking about Jesus here, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples in a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now he's yelling. I don't know if he's got his hands over his head or not, but he's yelling. And the people around him, it says many in the crowd, rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more. Now to set this, and it's an actual story, but to set it up for you so you you get a mental picture, Jesus is passing through Jericho on his way to Jerusalem. First half of Mark's gospel is all about the compassion of Christ. The word compassion in our English Bibles is translated from the Greek word splognitsomai, and it means from the gut. And so the whole beginning of Mark's gospel is all about the, the from the gut compassion Jesus expressed towards those who were sick or wounded or worried or powerless, just the way so many of us have felt for the last few months. Instead of expressing a hallmark kind of compassion or some kind of religious stiff kindness, Jesus expressed compassion from the gut, gut level compassion. So first half of Mark's gospel is all about the splognitsomai, the gut level compassion of Christ. Second half of Mark's gospel, there's a turn, we're right in the turn. Second half of Mark's gospel is all about the passion of the Christ. And I'm not talking about emotion. I'm not talking about how we feel after we've had a double espresso. The passion of the Christ in biblical literature means that Jesus was resolute about the cross. He knew exactly where he was going. He knew what Easter meant for him. He knew he was headed to his own death. And he was resolute about it. He said, this is my purpose. I'm passionate about this. It is worth it for me to lay down my life so that you will have yours. And so we're right at the turn. He makes this turn. He's passing through Jericho. It's his very last pit stop. I don't know about you, but if I knew I was headed to my own murder that was gonna be horrific and painful and humiliating, I might stop for a massage or for some carbo loading, but Jesus doesn't. Jesus doesn't stay at a nice hotel. He doesn't carve out some me time. He's still actively involved in expressing compassion, which just slays me given the context of this passage. So he's passing through a crowd forms, not necessarily because they believe in Jesus, they've just gotten all the Facebook forwards and Instagram stories and they've heard he's a healer. And so they decide they're gonna come together to see what he's like. So a crowd forms. Well, at the very back of the crowd, sitting on the curb, we're told in the Greek, is a guy named Bart. 
Bartimaeus. Now he's not part of that raucous crowd, partly because he's blind. And in the first century, if you had an ongoing medical illness or disease, it was assumed that you had unconfessed sin in your life. Remember how even the disciples of Jesus, when they encountered a blind man in John's gospel, they said, Jesus, who sinned? This blind dude or, or his parents? So it's assumed Bartimaeus is hiding something. So he is ostracized, ceremonially and literally. He's sitting at the back of the crowd, not engaged in the party, sitting at the back. He hears, obviously he can't see, he's blind. He hears Jesus is coming through. He hears people talking about, this is Jesus of Nazareth. This is that rabbi everybody's been talking about. It's that rabbi when he preaches, everybody says he's so good, you're not tempted to play Angry Birds. Like he's supposed to be so great. He hears it's Jesus coming through. And kind of against protocol, certainly cultural protocol, he begins to holler. That's what we'd say in the South anyway. He begins to yell, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And if we were meeting in person right now, so wish we were. I've watched Fresh Life so many times, so I'd, I feel like I know y'all. If we were meeting in person, I'd do a little quiz right now, and I'd say, what is significant about him calling Jesus the son of David? Because I know y'all know this answer. The fact that Bart called Jesus the son of David means Bart actually believed Jesus was the Christ. He's saying, I know, I know the prophecies. I know the backstory from Torah. I believe you are the son of God. Essentially, Bart is saying, I believe you're the only one who can help me take my life back. Wow. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Now remember, it's a religious crowd. They don't necessarily believe in Jesus, but they're a religious crowd because they've gathered to see him. So you'd think the crowd would kind of split like the Red Sea and they go, Bart, Bart, hey, come on, come on, be part of us. Come on, we'll usher you through to meet this rabbi. But they don't. Instead, it says the crowd rebukes him. And the word rebuke in the original language is actually much grittier than rebuke in English. In the original language, it's epitomio, and it means to command with the implication of a threat. How many of y'all are moms or dads? Okay, if you're a parent or a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, or as they say in Haiti, an, an auntie, then you have epitomio Epitomio looks like this. You're driving to church when we could actually attend in person and your kids are in the back seat. And um, if you're still cool, you only have two kids, you have an SUV. If you have more than two, you have a minivan because you just have to go there. But you're driving to church and your kids are fussing in the back seat and you tell them to be quiet, but they keep fighting over this imaginary line that they've drawn down the middle of the seat and they keep fussing, it gets louder and finally you aim the rear view mirror and you say something along the lines of, if y'all don't shut up, I'm gonna shut you up. <laughs> if y'all don't quit fussing, I'm gonna give you something to fuss about. If you don't, you know the language because we've all used it. I mean, not those of you who are really committed Christians and fill in your Bible study blanks, <laughs> but those of us who still struggle with sin and impatience, you know epitomio. It's stronger than rebuke. And that's what they do to Bard here. He says, son of David, Jesus. And they say, if you don't shut up, we're gonna shut you up. They were probably embarrassed. Jericho is a small city compared to Jerusalem. Doesn't have nearly the panache that Jerusalem has. They're probably like, Bart, quit being such a redneck. Like, don't ruin <laughs> our reputation. Shush, or we're gonna shut you up. When I was 40 years old, I went to a women's conference and one of the speakers was talking about adoption. Now, I'm 56 now, I'm single, I've never been married. I tease and say my husband is lost and won't stop to ask for directions. Um, so if you're interested, one 800 no, I'm teasing, um, mostly. But anyway, at 40, I realized, you know, I probably am not gonna be able to have children of my own. I've missed that window. And truth of the matter is, I was really, really broken in my 20s and 30s, very broken relationally. I was in some very abusive, very toxic relationships. And around 40, I realized, you know what? I'm afraid I'm never gonna get to be a parent. And I thought, you know, that's just the consequences of my own sin. I don't for a moment believe that our Redeemer is capricious. 
but there are consequences to sin. And I thought the consequence of my relational toxicity is I'm not going to get to be a mama. And um, I never really thought that I could adopt as a single woman. I just grew up in the South, super conservative Christian culture. So that wasn't even kind of on my radar. Then I went to this Christian women's conference and, and I actually went to a breakout session not realizing it was on adoption. It was on missions and I knew the speaker was interesting and I didn't want to go to one of the boring sessions about table settings or something. Not that there's anything wrong with that. But um, I thought I'll go to this missions uh, breakout. And then this girl, little teeny blonde girl, Jenny's size, got up and started talking about adoption. And she said there are 147 million, give or take a few orphans in the world as we know it, She talked about the fact that millions and millions of orphans die every year from very preventable diseases like malaria or having access to clean water. And then she paused uh, before stating a verse that most of you are probably familiar with. It's in the New Testament in James. And basically it says, if you've put your hope in Jesus, then you'll help the poor and the missed and the marginalized. You'll help widows and orphans. And she quoted that verse, and then she paused for a second, and again, like Jenny, very gracious, very petite. I didn't expect her to be so bossy. She paused, and then she kind of looked out over the sea of you know, women's Christian conference attendees with quilted Bible covers, and she said, what are you doing about it? And I remember thinking, well, I didn't, I didn't know I could do anything about it. You know, I'm old, my ovaries are raisins. I, I didn't know I could do anything about adoption. But you know how sometimes Pastor Levi will say something or Jenny will preach something and you'll go, goodness gracious, that just hooked something in my heart. And I don't know what God wants me to do about it, but I just get the sense he wants me to do something. And that's where I was after hearing her talking about adoption. So I thought, I'm not gonna tell everybody, I know y'all don't do this at Fresh Life, but... Sometimes in the South, women disguise gossip as prayer requests. So I thought, I'm not going to tell everybody. I'm just going to tell my small group that I feel like God is just kind of stirring my spirit over the issue of orphan care. I don't know what that means. I don't know if I'm supposed to do a you know, short-term or long-term missions and help in, a, in an orphanage in a third world country. I don't know if that just means giving more of my offering um, to ministries that... that are about orphan care. I'm not sure what I'm gonna do about it. I just know I've gotta take a step in this direction. And because I don't always hear super clearly from the Lord on my own, he's called us to community. He's made us in his image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God made us in his image and as in us. Our God perfectly existed, uh, Augustine says, as a community unto himself, God the Father. God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Be careful during this COVID season when you can't touch all your friends and you might not be able to meet in person. Be careful that you are not spiritually distancing. Be careful that you're reaching out, that you're connecting, that you're saying, even if you can't lay hands on me, lay hands on me through the phone. I need you to pray for me. I need you to pray with me. So I told this small group, I said, y'all, I need your help. I just need you to, to seek God's will on my behalf. I'm, I'm hearing, but I want to make sure I'm hearing the directions God's giving. He says in Isaiah that he'll whisper when we should turn to the right or when we should turn to the left. He doesn't try to be mysterious. He says, I want you to know the way that I want you to walk. So I said, well, y'all help me. Just help me here. And Three of them basically said, Lisa, we'll pray with you and we'll pray for you. We've got your back. They were really encouraging. One of them said, "Um, if you have time later on this week, I'd like to meet you in private and process this further. Um, Now, this is an aside. This has nothing to do with Fresh Life. Don't send Fresh Life ugly text or emails about this. This is just free. Um, If a really kind of grumpy looking Christian woman with elastic waist pants tells you she needs to meet with you in private because she has a word from the Lord just for you. Y'all need to take a friend. Um, But I've, as I told you, never been the sharpest tool in the shed. So I met this woman by myself. She was a member of my small group and woman who loved Jesus. It's interesting how sometimes Christians can use scripture as a club. She, she said, Lisa, I want to be really straight with you because you talked about the fact that you're praying about adoption. And she said, I don't know if that means you're considering becoming an adoptive parent, 
But I just wanna be real direct with you because the Bible says that the wounds of a friend are better than the kiss of an enemy. And then she came in with a club. She said, I just wanna be real frank and tell you, I don't think you should be a, a mom. She said, you have shared with our small group that you were sexually, sexually molested when you were younger. And she said, I know you've been to Christian counseling, but she said, Lisa, just in case you weren't fixed, you could potentially take some of that trauma you experienced as a child and unwittingly transfer that onto a child of your own. So she said, I just don't think you're a good candidate for parenthood. I know you really wanna nurture, so my advice to you would be to go to the Humane Society and adopt a, a dog because you're really good with pets. You know, she wasn't trying to be hateful. She really wasn't. She was trying to be truthful. Here's the deal. We are called to be in community, but the loudest voice has got to be Jesus. Right. Loudest voice has got to come from God's word. If somebody says something to you and it's not congruent with God's word, it's not from God. Everything we hear from pastors, teachers, friends, small group, community members, it has to be congruent with this text. And I should have recognized that a 40 year old, I've been walking with Jesus since I was a little girl. I should have recognized, gosh, the words fallen out of her mouth don't match the words my heavenly father speaks over me. Because God doesn't use shame as a motivational tool. And I thought, hmm, I should have known that, but I didn't, y'all. Because what she spoke paired up with my deepest bruise. My deepest bruise was, what if what happened in my past has put a lid on my future? What if, because of what I walked through then, it's damaged me to such a point that I would be a cruddy mom. It scared me to death. That was my greatest fear. That's the thing about the enemy. We do ourselves such a disservice when we caricaturize Satan, the father of lies. That's another thing I love about this, this message from Levi. He doesn't play when it comes to the enemy. We tend to, in Christian culture, caricaturize the father of lies, Satan, the enemy of our souls. We caricaturize him as like wearing a red onesie, a Beyonce onesie with horns. And we make him like this cartoon, innocuous cartoon character. That is not who he is. Scripture says he's a carnivore. He is seeking who he can devour. He is planning today to rob, steal, kill, and destroy. And here's how he does it the most effectively. I know with me, but I bet some of y'all he's done this. He doesn't say things to me that I would know right away, oh, that's a lie. Like when the enemy is messing with me, trying to jack me up, he never says, Lisa, you're such an introvert with such a high metabolism. I mean, if he said that, I'd be like, liar, liar, pants on fire. I would see him from a distance. That's not how he talks to me. The enemy, when he's trying to take my life, what the enemy does is he, he takes a, a, a really painful, usually a really painful chapter from my past, and he speaks something that happened to me that broke my heart, and then he stirs that with some toxicity. And when he presents it, it smells like the truth. So when that woman said, you might be too messed up from your past to make a good mother, it resonated with me. Instead of going before the Lord and going, Lord, is this what you would say to me? I didn't. I thought, oh, she's probably right. And I had secretly printed out an adop adoption application. I was 40 years old. After I met with her, I put that in the very back of my file drawer and the next day when I got off work, I went to the Nashville Humane Society and I adopted a chocolate lab named Sally with bladder control problems. My third dog that season, sweet dog. But she was not God's best for me that season. Y'all, anybody who says to you that you need to lower your expectations or keep a lid on it, that's not a voice congruent with God's word. We might need a new choir. So if anybody's speaking words of death over your life and they have it covered with scripture even, pretend like it's from the Lord, take it to God's word. Because anybody who's saying you need to put a lid on it and you need to lower your expectations, that's not congruent with God's word. I wish I had been more like Bartimaeus. 
Because when the crowd around Bartimaeus says, put a lid on it, lower your expectations, shut up. Do you know what he does? It's one of my favorite verses in Mark's gospel. Look back at this. And if you've got your highlighter, highlight this baby because we'll need to come back to it. It's so great. And many rebuked him, epitomized him, said we're gonna beat you up if you don't shut up, telling him to be silent. But he cried out, all the more. Don't you love that? Y'all, that's a secret when it comes to taking your life back. If the world around you goes, you know, that's just not very appropriate, cry out all the more for God to reveal himself to you. I love Jesus' response. And Jesus stopped. And Jesus stopped. Now, y'all remember the context? Jesus is on his way to Easter He's on his way to Jerusalem. This is his very last pit stop. Hear me, because the social historical context of this is huge. He's on his way to Easter. And he effectively puts Easter on pause for one person. One man. One man that nobody else would even give the benefit of the conversation One man that his whole little community had tried to shut him up. Jesus stops. Isn't that profound? I mean, doesn't that just slay you? That he always chooses us, even over purpose. He says, hang on just a minute. Let's put the cross on on pause for just a second. Because this guy needs me. He leaves the 99 for the one. Anybody who tries to tell you that our God is not loving is a liar and has not read his word. Our God is so kind. He's so personal. He's so loving. He sees you. I know some of y'all, because of COVID, because of your circumstances right now, feel completely invisible. That is not spiritual reality. It might be your circumstantial reality. But as Levi says, what you see right now is not what is really true. Yeah. You can't see the God who breathed this earth into existence looking at you going, I'm right here. I'm right here. I've got you. I'm right here. Jesus stops and he says, bring him to me. Can you imagine how embarrassed the crowd was? You know, (laughs) pretending to be religious. They've been shushing this needy guy. Oh yeah, sure, sure. We'll come. We'll get him. And so they, they get Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus comes. He stands before Jesus and this is what happens. They called the blind man saying to him, take heart, get up. He is calling you and throwing off his cloak. Bart sprang up and came to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, what do you want me to do for you? Can you imagine if you could see Jesus wherever you are right now in your watch party? Can you imagine if Jesus comes walking in? He'd be wearing a a robe because that's what Jewish men wore in the first century. There would be blue tassels on the robe because that's what they told him to do to remind him of the law. He'd probably have long hair brown hair, he's Jewish, so he wouldn't be the blonde, you know, super pale guy that the Germans painted. He's, he's a Jewish guy. But can you imagine if Jesus came walking up into your watch party and you could see him with your natural eyes and he looked at you, he looked at you on the couch by yourself with your Lean Cuisine and he said, what do you need me to do for you? I mean, can you imagine? Y'all, he's here. The Bible says where two or three are gathered. I mean, he's in our midst. We just can't see him with our natural eyes. Bart's standing in front of Jesus, the son of God. And Jesus says, Bart, what do you need? I always picture Bart standing there. Now, this is my word, not God's word. Um, my imagination, not, not holy writ. But I imagine Bart standing there. I imagine him going, Jesus, I want to see my, my son round third. Uh, I lost my sight when he was just a little guy. Last time I've seen him swing a bat was in T-ball. And my boy's gotten really good. He bats fourth. And I've cheered myself hoarse. I've lost my voice listening to my boy play, but I've never seen him around third. I'd love to see my boy score. Jesus, I'd love to see my wife smile again. Her smile is what grabbed my heart in the first place. I was working on my dissertation in a coffee shop in downtown Kalispell. And a door, I heard the bell on the door behind me and I turned around and she walked in and her eyes met and her face split into a grin and I lost my heart. My wife had me at first smile. Jesus, I haven't seen her smile in 11 years. I would 
just about do anything, Yeshua. If I could see my boy around third and run toward home and I could see the love of my life smile again. And Jesus says to Bartimaeus, this man nobody else would listen to. And Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him along the way. It's interesting that it says he recovered his sight, which sounds like the greatest miracle in the passage. I don't think it is. I think the greatest miracle in the passage is the trajectory of Bart's life. He went from being completely alone on the curb, basically sitting out on life, to following Jesus along the way. Do you know before they called us Christians, Christ followers, in the middle first century, they called those who believed in Jesus members of the way. Jim Bartimaeus is included as that very small group of Christian leaders who followed Jesus all the way up Golgotha. Do you know Bart was sitting there as Jesus stretched out his arms and said, it's finished. My grace has covered your life. Bart followed him that whole way. Bart is counted among the leadership of the early church in Acts. He went from being completely checked out in life, completely missed in life, to being a great spiritual leader. Speaking of spiritual leaders, Eugene Peterson is one of my favorites. He wrote the message. That's just one of his many, many, many books. But Eugene Peterson defines obedience as a long walk in the same direction. What he does not define obedience as is a parade down Main Street. Sometimes risky faith and the most rewarding faith, there are seasons of that that's a solo walk. We are called to community But as God stirs in you things that you're supposed to do, places you're supposed to stand in order to take your life back, in order to really rest in the love that God has for you to actually move into him into a more intimate relationship with Jesus. For a few of you, it may be lonely for a season. There's a long way Bart followed Jesus all the way up Golgotha. Very few made that walk. Very few took their life back to that extent. Rewarding faith is usually risky. I um, love that part of Bart's story. I love that the best part of his story was, was so different than he probably even imagined. He thought everything would be good again if I could just see. And Jesus said, oh, I've got so much more than sight for you. Um, for seven years, I was afraid to stick my, stick my toe back in the adoption pond, afraid I would be a really bad mom. And then at 47, the Lord in his kindness just said, it's time for you to stand up. It's time for you to get off the curb. It's time for you to take your life back. And I contacted an adoption agency and I said, I, I don't wanna put my name in the hat for a kid who has a good shot at a mom and a dad. I believe that's best case scenario for children who are adopted. But I said, if there is an orphan case that comes your way and the child doesn't seem to have a great shot at a mama and a daddy, um, I think a a fluffy single woman living in Middle Tennessee is a better option than death. And so if there's one of those situations, I'd love to be considered. And uh, I can't tell you the whole story, but bottom line is I lost two adoptions before I got paired with Missy. And y'all, I felt like my heart had been run over by trucks on the pavement. I wasn't sure I could peel it back up. That's the thing about taking your life back too. Sometimes it's painful. I think the greatest gifts are often on the other side of rivers of tears. I love that Levi says you, you get to a point that you just keep going. He talked about in the study guide a, a day in Teddy Roosevelt's life. And he said, a switch flipped inside and he, President Roosevelt, became unstoppable in his resolve for the rest of his life. He referred to that day, July 1st, 1898, as the greatest day of his life, the day the wolf rose in his heart. 
the wolf rose in my heart in 2012 and I lost two adoptions. Um, and the second one I thought would just about kill me emotionally. I lost a baby four days before I was supposed to bring her home and um, was just devastated. And two weeks after that, I got a phone call from a girl I hadn't seen in years. And she said, Lisa, she said, um, I know you just lost Anna Price. And she said, and I know that was really devastating. And I don't know if you even have the bandwidth to pray about this. But she said, I just got home from Haiti last night. And while I was in Haiti, one of the young moms in the village I was visiting died of AIDS, undiagnosed AIDS. She didn't know she had AIDS. And she left behind a two-year-old little girl. And she's really sick, this little girl. She has HIV, she has cholera, she um, has tuberculosis, she's malnourished. And the doctors in Haiti said that she probably won't live more than two months. And she said, while I was in the ER, with uh, the people who are helping at this village. She said, I just felt Jesus speak to my spirit. And he said, Lisa Harper is supposed to be Missy's mom. And she said, so I know this is probably really presumptuous, but I just wanted to call you and ask if you'd think, if you'd pray about the possibility of stepping into another adoption journey. And I said, no, I won't pray about it. I said, I've been praying about this for 30 years sign me up. And I got off the phone and y'all, the first word that came out of my mouth was not biblical. I won't tell you what it is, but it rhymes with wit. And I thought, goodness gracious, I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to adopt a child who they're saying is dying. I I have no idea how to do this. Taking your life back involves taking the next step. You don't have to see around the corner of where God is calling you. Just get off the curb like Bart and take the next right step. All I did was say yes. And then I said a bad word because I thought, I can't do this. And I sensed God in the spirit say, no, honey, you can't. But I've got your back and I'm going to carry you. And two years later, April 14th, 2014, I brought my little girl home from Haiti. Y'all, she's 11 years old. She's healthy as a horse. Her HIV has been undetectable for six years. She is other than Jesus. She's the greatest gift in my life. And I almost missed her. I almost missed her. I almost stayed on the curb after somebody said, you're not quite good enough. That's a lie. It's a lie from the pit of hell. God has called you to a greater place than you're living now. He loves you more than you can possibly imagine. He is coming for you. He may even be using the stillness of COVID to drown out the really loud lies in your life so that you can hear his voice saying, come here, come closer to me, get off the curb. Intimacy with Jesus is not found in managing our expectations. It's found in raising them to accommodate miracles. He loves you. I want to pray for those of you who don't yet know Jesus. You've been watching Fresh Life because a friend told you about it. You've been reading Jenny's books and Levi's books and Louis's books and Shelley's books, and they all resonate with you, but there's some secret corner of your heart that, like me, believes that your past has impeded your future. There's some place in you that feels like you need to put a lid on that expectation that may be a holy God, because that actually love a man like you with a past, a woman like you that some people have said was dirty or damaged. He loves you so much. My pastor back home, my favorite story he tells involves a wedding. And he said he had just graduated from seminary. He was nervous as a cat to be officiating this wedding. This was a very formal wedding involving two very wealthy families. He said he was standing up front right before the wedding started and the groomsmen had all come into his left and the bridesmaid had come into his right. Everybody was wearing couture. He said he was just so nervous. He said then they, they started the organ and the bride appeared on the back of the, at the back of the church in the middle aisle on the arm of her dad. 
And he said before he could stop him, the bridegroom just ran from his position and started running down the middle aisle toward his bride. He said he was so overwhelmed by her beauty that he just broke protocol and just took off after his bride. And Scotty said he had to pull up his robes, jump off the platform, chase down the bridegroom, drag him by the back of his tux and pull him back into position. Y'all, that's how Jesus describes himself in scripture that he is a bridegroom who can't wait to be with you. And Song Solomon says, with one glance of your eyes, you've captured my heart. Hollywood stole the line from the Bible, you had God at hello. It's time to get off the curb, isn't it? Time to move into the arms of Jesus. Wherever you are, you don't have to close your eyes. That tends to be kind of a religious thing. You can keep your eyes open, but will you just come before the Lord with me right now. And if you feel the Lord stir in your spirit and you want to be known, you want to be found, you want to be seen by God, you want to be loved with a love that will never, ever fade or fail. He will not leave you alone. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I'm a mess. I'm a hot mess. I've made so many mistakes that have separated me from your holiness. I've committed so many sins. And Jesus, some sins have been committed against me that have just about broken my heart. So I need your forgiveness and I need your healing. Like Bartimaeus, I believe you are the only one who can bring me life. The only one who can give me my life back. So Jesus, today I put my hope in you. I confess that you are the king of all kings. I don't understand it all, Jesus, but I believe. I believe you came to this world in a suit of skin. I believed you lived a perfect life. I believe you willingly walked up a hill and you spread out your arms and you died on a cross to reconcile me, a hot mess, with a holy God my creator, redeemer. So today, right now, Jesus, I just commit myself into your hands. And I say you are my only hope. Here's my heart, Jesus. Help me to rest in your affection. And then Jesus, give me the grace to take the next right step. Closer toward you. Closer toward the rest of the abundant life that you've provided for me. Amen and amen Amen. and amen. It has been pure joy to be with y'all. Thank you so much for for letting me me do life with y'all today. It's been a joy.